Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second of um, Anne Bond's talks. Um, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce Anne Bonds today. Um, as my colleague Keith Woodward offered yesterday in his introductions, Anne Bonds is an associate professor of geography at UW Milwaukee, um, a leading feminist economic geographer and scholar of racism and white supremacy. She's also a close collaborator and friend of mine, as Patrick mentioned. So it is wonderful um, for Anne to be with us here, even if virtually. So I want to offer some sense of the scope of Dr. Bond's work across the discipline and broader disciplines. As a longtime scholar of housing, racialized poverty in the carceral state, her new position as editor of the journal Urban Geography may not sound all that surprising. After all, she has been part of moving forward issues of race within under and racism within understandings of economic geography and property um, through living and teaching in Milwaukee. Um, is also part of vigorous debates over racism, policing, property, and the racialization of space. Um, so that lived experience is part of, I think, an important part of being a, a geographer, an editor of a geography journal. What's also notable is that she brings extensive research on and upbringing in rural spaces to this role. She began her career in geography studying the political economy of rural prison construction and more recently has written on uh, the armed takeover of public lands in Oregon by white residents, You've probably all heard about the Bundy family. Um, so Bond's work shows that urban and rural spaces are not separate but rather interrelated through racial capitalist and settler colonial processes. So her theorizations of white supremacy and property are as tuned to broader debates in the country over how to interpret the political landscape as they are to debates within geography and American studies more broadly over how to understand racism as articulated with capitalism, um, inquiries now that are largely framed in terms of racial capitalism. So much as anthropology has worked to question its complicity in colonial projects, scholars in geography are engaged with accounting for our own entanglements with colonial, racial, and military projects. Anne's writing on racism and white supremacy as logics and historical processes that create material geographies and uneven life chances build from the radical black, black radical tradition and black feminisms among other um, theoretical frameworks to question how whiteness can come to be understood as a possession. These debates are not merely theoretical but are also part of contending with how the overwhelming whiteness of the discipline of geography has shaped understandings of space and place more broadly. So when Anne arrived at UWM, she inherited a large lecture uh, undergraduate course on geographies of race, which had been started by Dr. Harold Rose. Dr. Rose, uh, who passed away five years ago, um, was an African-American geographer uh, who became the first African-American president of the American Association of Geographers. The class Dr. Rose instituted decades ago remained, um, let's say, uncommon for many geography departments across the country for some time. And that's changing, but um, belatedly. So I'll return to the importance of this pedagogical space in a moment as it relates to the final theme I want to underscore about Dr. Bond's work, the importance of feminist praxis. Some of this can be seen in her work on social reproduction, which can be found in publications on feminist economic geography, her progress in human geography piece on uh, white women's role in reproducing white supremacy, and a widely read article on the importance of feminist care ethics for transforming the conditions of learning and working in the academy, or in a recent article on how men's careers benefit from sexual gender and racial harassment. The less visible and equally important work of anti-racist feminism is in creating conditions for students and early career scholars to, to pursue anti-racist and feminist work. And in treating Dr. Rose's class as an inheritance, not of property, but as an ethical opening for upholding black scholarship and creating more racially just and freer futures. So with that, I welcome Dr. Ann Bonds. Thank you, Jenna. Um, that was a really just 
beautiful, warm introduction. Thank you so much. Um, one of the crazy things about communicating and working in these environments is that I just got kicked out of this meeting. And so I didn't get to hear a portion of that. I heard the first part of it, but um, thank you so much for you know being so attentive to kind of tracking my scholarship over a period of time. And I'll look forward to going back and listening to the whole thing. Um, I wanna just thank everybody uh, for joining me today. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. Uh, well, let's see if we can get it here. Oh. Okay, let's. Wow, after yesterday, I was feeling pretty good, like no tech problems. And then today I'm having the issues. So thank you all for your patience. Here we go. Everybody see that okay? All right, there we go. So, okay, now that we have tech issues under control, thank you again, everybody for coming. Um, thanks to Patrick, uh, to Jenna, to Keith, to everybody who was involved in coordinating things. Uh, my presentation today uh, builds from, at least conceptually and theoretically, uh, some of the points that came up yesterday, um, uh, specifically the fact that um, I really wanna think about white supremacy um, as not just a logic, but a socio-spatial relation of power. Um, and one that's grounded in and unfolds in place through what Laura Polito calls the variegated landscapes of race. Um, and so today I really wanna think about how some of those dynamics that we talked about yesterday, the, the privatized mutuality, the building up of suburbs, the exclusion of African-Americans and other low income uh, people of color uh, took place um, in this city. I wanna to begin today uh, with this map. Uh, the map comes from the publication Salon and their mapping of the most segregated cities in the nation. Um, and, you know, in this case, in their estimation, Milwaukee is ranked number one as the most segregated city in the nation. Um, and, uh, it, you know, this kind of fluctuates in different kinds of measures and with different sorts of dissimilarity indices, but Milwaukee is always within the top five of the most segregated, um, segregated metropolitan areas in the country. And this isn't the most beautiful map, it's actually kind of clunky, um, but I choose to start with it uh, because it shows not only the degree of racial segregation in the Milwaukee metro area, but also the concentration of racial groups in particular areas. So within this example, um, we see that the darkest shades represent 85% more of one racial group. And so what the map really does an excellent job of demonstrating for me um, are these wow counties, um, Washington, Ozaki, Waukesha County. Um, these are areas that are 85% um, more or more white. Um, they're predominantly wealthy areas and they form what Mayor Frank Zeidler once called the iron ring around Milwaukee. And so while people frequently lament uh, Milwaukee's segregated landscape, um, what, one of the things that people often don't take note of is the fact that Milwaukee also has, and it's an attending dynamic here, it has the lowest rate of black suburbanization in the country. So while just about 10% of black households live in Milwaukee's metro, metro, metro excuse me, suburbs, over 80% of white households in this region live in the suburbs. And this is a really extremely striking dynamic that underscores not just these past dynamics that I'm going to explore today, but also the ongoing processes that are at work to sustain these race class segregated geographies. In the late January or late January of 2020, uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported on uh, new data identifying falling rates of owner occupancy in Milwaukee and a sharp increase in the number of residential properties owned by individuals and companies located outside of the city. The data illuminate both a striking growth in landlords operating multiple properties in the city, and this was a number that quadrupled between 2005 and 2019. The story also documents uh, the soaring number of landlords in, in Milwaukee residing in the suburbs. From 2005 to 2019, the number of suburban landlords uh, grew by 70%. Uh, from owning 7,700 uh, 7, residential properties in 2005 to more than 13,000 in 2019. 
linking this recession um, to the, excuse me, linking the tidal wave of foreclosures uh, to the Great Recession um, and to these areas that have, uh, that have just experienced these layers of devastation. The authors of the study um, argue that these new trajectories, these new trends signal a massive transfer of housing wealth outside the city. And here um, I've just included, I'm, it's kind of clunky here, but I just included the inset of the Milwaukee segregation map so that you can kind of see how these geographies overlap. The article concludes by posing questions about the long-term implications of this wealth transfer, noting that, quote, for decades, Milwaukee was a city of strong, cohesive neighborhoods. Its residents bound in part by something they had in common, the investments in their homes, end quote. This nostalgic statement neutralizes an otherwise critical analysis of the extractive economies of property in Milwaukee. Its emphasis on neighborhood co cohesion conjures the language of neighborhood racial and ethnic homogeneity that was exalted and enshrined in 20th century housing policy, obscuring the violence of residential property markets premised on racism, racial exclusion in the making of America's most segregated city. Nonetheless, the article's emphasis on residential property ownership and racialized wealth accumulation illustrates a number of concerns, um, a number of issues, questions that are of increasing concern to critical geographers examining the historical contingency of race and property markets. How is uh, property enacted discursively and material, materially? And what are its social and political effects? What forms of, how do forms of property and race co-evolve through the dialectics of possession and struggle? In my remaining time today, I first would like to situate housing covenants and white mobilizations uh, against public housing, which is really the focus of my talk, um, within what Jody Bird, Alyosha Goldstein, Jody Melamed, and Shandon Reddy call economies of dispossession, referring to, quote, multiple and intertwined genealogies of racialized property, subjection, appropriate, and appropriation through which capitalism and colonialism take place or take shape historically and change over time, end quote. From this really brief discussion, I then situate and contextualize Milwaukee, which is also often called the Selma of the North for its milit militant civil rights activism, particularly around housing and desegregation throughout the 1960s. As I noted yesterday in my talk, the dynamics leading up to the open housing demonstrations must be grounded within Milwaukee's unique political, economic, and racial formations, and particularly here, its ethnic labor hierarchies and its socialist municipal governance. And so I'm gonna bring these details into my discussions in the talk. Next, I'll turn to my collaborative research on racially restrictive covenants, which W.E.B. Du Bois uh, described as, quote, the most discouraging uh, situation facing Black Americas and Jim Crow, Black Americans and Jim Crow, excuse me, end quote. This is a project um, I'm developing with my colleague, uh, Derek Handley, um, and it's, af it's after many years of partnership with the Mapping Prejudice Project based out of the University of Minnesota. And um, I don't have time today to talk about our methodology or how this project is taking place, but I'd love to talk about it. Um, in brief, it, we're, we're in the process, we have digital copies right now of uh, about 5 million uh, images and we're going to be uh, using uh, computer technology uh, to basically flag any of those um, uh, images that might contain uh, deed covenants that are racialized. So our project seeks not just uh, to comprehensively map all racial covenants filed in Milwaukee County between 1910 and 1960, but also to chart black and multiracial forms of resistance to housing covenants and to efforts to limit black access to housing in the early part of the 20th century. And so our goal with this project is really to complicate narratives about what was done to African Americans and to black Milwaukeeans by illuminating the interplay between resistance and efforts to maintain white dominance in housing markets. And in taking this focus, we hope that our research can enrich and enhance understandings of Milwaukee's um, civil rights uprisings that took place in later decades. <clears throat> 
finally today, I'll shift uh, to my I'll shift my focus to the post World War II conflict over public housing in Milwaukee, which I argue uh, was really a critical moment for the reconfiguration both of Milwaukee's racial political economy, but of municipal politics uh, in the area. I again emphasize this notion of hostile privatism, a logic entrenched within the segregation and racialization of space. And I see this as a key feature um, of the massive white resistance to Milwaukee's growing po black population and efforts to, build, and efforts to uh, provide housing during a housing crisis. During this time, um, public housing was framed and attacked both as black and as quote, socialistic. So I'm especially interested in the ways that real estate interests and white coalitions mobilized against public housing to defend white property interests in, way, in ways that gave rise to those privatized mutualities that I discussed yesterday. So emphasizing the logics of possession and hostile privatism, I focus then today on how real estate interests and property owners effectively stalled and encumbered demands uh, for public housing, affordable housing, and that these efforts actually helped shape and give rise to the historic social movement for open housing um, that we are probably many of us familiar with today. Let's see here, there we go. Uh, briefly, I'd like to turn to this idea of dispossession, again, thinking about um, these kinds of property logics. Though ge geographers have long interrogated property as it relates to privatization, uh, there is resurging interest, particularly um, building from Nicholas Bomley's path defining work in tracing the uh, modern gene, or excuse me, in tracing the genealogies of modern property relations. Melanie Ranganathan and I contend that this renewed interest and the attention is defined by an insistence that the production under, of capital, uh, property under capitalism is inseparable from historically contingent categories of difference. Property is not only an essential component of capitalist political economy, one that both enables capitalist accumulation and, its, and structures its legal and political organization, it's also a shifting social formation, a contradictory set of relations animated by modern understandings of citizenship and the law. So theorized this way, uh, property is not a fixed entity, um, but it's rather an unfolding set of relations that both necessitates and reshapes the hierarchical ordering and valuation of differentiated bodies and places. Writing against the common sense assumption that it is a faceless and blameless market that prices the poor out from real estate, or that urban decline is part of some kind of a natural cycle of development. Critical urban scholarship examines de de the deliberate financial inst instruments, forms of policing, state logics, and planning protocols that produce racial regimes of property, vacancy, and occupancy and the material consequences and formations therein. So then central to the scholarship is insistence that the technologies of planning, law, and public policy, along with state actors, industry abettors, and private landlorders, landlords and homeowners are culpable for codifying racial segregation in urban and suburban space. Okay, with this kind of theoretical setup, now I'd like to shift my focus to talk a, more in detail about Milwaukee. As I'm sure uh, many of us who are here today are familiar, uh, Milwaukee is the site of intense activism over uh, open housing. And on October 28th, 1967, just over 50 years ago, the Milwaukee NAACP Youth Council and Commandos together with their advisor, Father James Grappi, commenced the first of a series of historic marches demanding the passage of open housing legislation, or pardon, pardon me, a passage of an open housing ordinance for the city. And it's really worth noting here um, that, the, that open, open housing ordinances had been brought to the city council for vote five times in the years leading up to this by Alderwoman Belle Phillips. Um, so she started this process in 1962, brought the ordinances up five times. Each time they were voted down 10 to one with her only be being the only vote in the affirmative. So the March, uh, the first March on the, uh, August uh, 28th followed um, 
unrest in the city just one month earlier when demonstrators uh, when demonstrations about housing discrimination and police brutality were violently suppressed. The uprising, which was later dubbed um, uh, the Milwaukee riot, took place even as the fires from the Detroit rebellion were still smoldering. Mayor Henry Mayer, a vocal opponent of open housing, responded with the full power of the repressive state calling in the National Guard to strengthen the already heavy police presence and imposing strict curfews that halted movement throughout the city. A month later, um, the first housing, uh, open housing march crossed the 16th Street Viaduct, known as uh, Milwaukee's Mason-Dixon Line, uh, connecting the predominantly Black North Side to the white working class South Side. And at the time, um, this bridge, this viaduct was um, colloquially known as the, quote, bridge connecting Africa to Polonia. Let's see if we can, there we go. The small group was met by a crush of 5,000 white counter protesters who threw bottles and rocks, burned effigies and shouted racist slurs. And I always feel the need to take a moment um, at this point in the talk and just reflect upon the, the fact that these were, um, this was a youth council. Uh, this was a primarily youth of color um, who, who met this violent mob. The scene was so tense that Groppy, in advance of a march planned for the following day, reportedly said, quote, if there's any man or woman here who is afraid of going to jail for his freedom, is afraid of getting tear gassed, or is afraid of dying, you should not have come to this meeting tonight. The next day, the group of about 200, marching in defiance of the mayor's prohibition on protest, oops, sorry about that, I'll hold up, um, was met by an even larger white mob with numbers swelling to over 13,000. And just after this second march, uh, the NAACP Youth Council's headquarters, which was known as the Freedom House, was set on fire and destroyed. Uh, Milwaukee police concluded in their investigation that the fire was started by a firebomb, while members of the Youth Council maintain and actually continue to maintain, those who are still alive today, that the fire was the result of police tear gas. The the fair housing marches lasted for 200 consecutive days, even as civic leaders and white power groups alike rallied in opposition to housing. So the focus of my research and discussion today is about what happened in the decades leading up to these marches. So what happened before the eruption of the open housing marches in, 19, in the 1960s. While examinations of racial struggles over housing in Milwaukee often start from these housing mobilizations in the 1960s, I want to consider the housing dynamics prior to this, especially in the pre and post World War era, and how they informed and gave rise to these later movements. So before I turn to the 20th century and to the early part of the 20th century specifically, I want to begin um, by noting that the place that we today call Milwaukee is situated on the traditional homelands of the Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk, and the Menominee on the southwestern shores of Lake Michigan, where the Menominee, did I just say southwestern? Not a very good geographer. Let's try that again. The southeastern shores of, of Lake Michigan, um, where the Menominee, Kinnicknick, and Milwaukee rivers meet, and where the people of the Anishinaabe, the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican remain present. Milwaukee was long a site of tribal trade and transportation and, even, and remained so even as white, uh, primarily French fur traders and Jesuit missionaries arrived throughout the 18th and, 17th, or 18th and 19th centuries. Many struggles and alliances emerged throughout the 18th and 19th centuries in wars over settler possession and control of the Great Lakes territories. Between the French and the British, between the British and the Americans, and ultimately, after the British lost control of the Great Lakes region in 1814, when the US settler state commenced its project of Indian removal in earnest. Even after um, there were these efforts uh, to appropriate and dispossess, uh, uh, even as efforts to appropriate and dispossess were met with indig indigenous resistance and refusal, the US state implemented assimilationist policy primarily through boarding schools and land allotments, such as those mandated by the Dawes Act in 1887. 
And this was an attempt to disrupt communal land tenure and to implement a settler regime of private property ownership and agricultural uh, production. Now, this is an extremely complex history that I've distilled um, and, and problematically distilled for purposes of this talk. But I want to insist and make this point here uh, that Milwaukee is and always has been a native place. Urban relocation during the 1950s and 60s brought a resurgence of indigenous populations in Milwaukee, despite the federal government's ongoing efforts to el eliminate tribal sovereignty. Most native peoples resettled in Milwaukee's north and south sides, living alongside the city's black, Latinx, and growing Hmong populations. It's impossible to talk about Milwaukee's historic patterns of segregation and their struggles over housing without considering its industrial past, present, and afterlives. Known popularly as the machine shop of the world, Milwaukee and its, was a port city, and its rivers, the Menominee, the KK, and Milwaukee, uh, supported a broadly decentralized manufacturing industry. Um, I'm missing some maps here, my apologies. Um, and what I mean by this is that industry was never concentrated in one particular area of the city, but rather it was fairly, it, it was distributed fairly evenly across the urban landscape, um, which really led to an intensified patterns of early ethnic segregation in the city. Um, and I've listed some of these early patterns right here. As the city's industrial economy grew, streams of new migrants arrived in the city. Huge German populations initially, but also Poles, British, Irish, Scandinavians, Serbs, Russian Jews, and much, much later, as I discuss next, African Americans. By 1910, Milwaukee was known as, quote, the most foreign city in America, with European ethnic Im immigrant groups comprising uh, more, of its, more, more of its population than any other city. Um, New York was really close behind it. So this was a very distinct, um, a distinct pattern of, of ethnic uh, of, and class segregation, in part because of immigration streams, but in part because of the decentralized nature of manufacturing in the city. A close read of the qualitative data used to produce Milwaukee's redlining map shows that uh, redlined areas were predominantly made up of quote unquote undesirable ethnic groups and poor and working class populations. While common understandings of security maps frame these discriminatory real estate assessments as a means to enclose or confine urban Black populations, and this may be the case in other cities, but in Milwaukee, the map is better understood as preventative. Um, and the map sustained already existing patterns of ethnic and class segregation, um, segregating ethnic groups racialized at the time as non-white. And here I'm speaking specifically about Polish, the Polish um, Americans, Russian Jews, Serbs, and Italians that lived in the city. Of course, the map supported disinvestment in these areas and delineated the places where black migrants uh, would later arrive in the 20th century. However, this highlights the importance of thinking about residential security maps beyond the black white binary um, of urban segregation to also consider these dynamics of ethnicity and class and the ways in which these maps uh, created by real estate interests were fundamentally about protecting white property interests and possessive geographies. The role of residential property in consolidating white suburban political and economic power and in insulating marginalized poor communities is well documented. And I argue um, in my research that Milwaukee is distinctive or something that we should think about for a number of reasons. Notably, um, the arrival of uh, the late arrival of black migrants uh, significantly shaped anti-blackness in the city. And it also significantly shaped debates around uh, housing and urban renewal and the creation of white possessive geographies. Further, Milwaukee's socialist political tradition contoured anti-black racism, racism and the city's inability to support integrated public housing. So it's these dynamics that I'd like to shift to now. In 1944, Zeddy Quitman Heiler left New Albany, Mississippi as part of the late great migration of African-Americans traveling for better opportunities in the urban North. After a decade of working and living in Milwaukee, 
he decided that he wanted to build a house for his family in Wauwatosa, a suburb neighboring the city's western boundary. However, Wauwatosa, like many other places in Milwaukee County, relied upon racial housing covenants to restrict any non-white persons from living in the community. To subvert this racist practice, Heiler asked his white friend to buy the property and then sell it to Heiler. Despite community resistance, Heiler was able to build his house in 1955 and actually remained there until his death in 2004. Um, his, his nephew actually lives in the house now, and I should note that his, his house in the process of being built was repeatedly vandalized, uh, such that people had to set up watches to make sure that um, construction wasn't uh, devastated in the, in the nights. Um, so many other covenant-breaking families um, throughout the country faced uh, very different outcomes, including mob violence um, and loss of their homes. In the first half of the 20th century, racial covenants prohibiting non-white people from buying or occupying housing and certain parcels of land were used throughout US cities for segregationist purposes. And a covenant is a type of contract included in a property deed referring to the conditions attached to housing or land. The violation of a covenant con uh, con the violation of covenant conditions, excuse me, comes with the risk of foregoing a, a property. And, and indeed this happened many times. Racially restrictive covenants began appearing in, in deeds with much greater frequency at the turn of the century, becoming a common, commonplace and withstanding multiple court challenges throughout the 1910s, 20s and 30s. By 1928, over half of all homes owned by white people in the United States were covenanted. Racial covenants were often written into deeds uh, by private developers and home builders, drawing on language and examples developed by the real estate industry. And I just have a couple of examples from Milwaukee and I just call your attention to that this sign, this is a sign that used to, that people used to see if they were traveling from Milwaukee into Wauwatosa. Um, it says entering Wauwatosa city of homes restrictive. And so this is just a way to signal to people that the properties are restricted. Um, so these covenants were enforced by the courts endorsed and encouraged by the Federal Housing Administration, and their implementation required the mutual cooperation of a number of parties. White property owners agreeing not to sell or rent to people of color, federal, county, and municipal authorities enforcing and supporting the covenants, and the real estate boards, neighborhood associations, and property developers who enacted and applied the deed restrictions. The use of racial covenants uh, became more widespread after racially restrictive zoning was struck down um, in 1917 in the case of Buchanan versus Worley. And then again, following a 1926 case, in this case, it was Corgan versus Buckley that validated and upheld their use. In 1948, a key Supreme, a Supreme Court case, which was Shelley versus Kramer, determined that restrictive covenants were illegal, but not, or excuse me, were legal, but not enforceable. However, as our early research in Milwaukee is un uncovering, um, racial covenants continued to be registered after well after 1948. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1968, until 1968 and the passage of the Fair Housing Act, that discrimination on the basis of, of race and the sale and rental of housing was outlawed. Though racial covenants have been illegal for well over 50 years and unenforceable for over 70, they remain embedded in property deeds throughout Milwaukee County as evidence of the ways in which racism and segregationist efforts uh, mapped race and urban development. Of course, racial covenants uh, were just one of many mechanisms that were explicitly designed to separate urban populations by race. And they worked in conjunction with a whole range of other efforts, including federal policies, patterns of lending, municipal ordinances, and private practices that ensured the racial segregation of American cities. And I always like this quote of this poem by Langston Hughes. Here he's talking about racial covenants in Chicago. A significant and growing body of scholarship documents the role of federal housing policies and real estate practices um, in the production of racially segregated urban geographies. 
And this literature examines how zoning, planning, and federal subsidies for housing and suburban development were predicated on the exclusion of people of color. Um, there's a lot of focus right now on the role of residential security maps um, and the practice of redlining low income non white neighborhoods as uh, playing a significant role in systematizing urban racial segregation. And I'm happy to talk more about this in the, in the Q&A. And then one of the things that, of course, we know is that the impact and urban re uh, redevelopment and renewal projects that occurred throughout cities uh, devastated vibrant African American commercial districts displaced communities of color, and further diminished affordable housing options. Um, so at the municipal scale, mu municipalities and private actors backed real estate practices and patterns of lending that further guaranteed the racial homogeneity of neighborhoods. These uh, mechanisms of racism in housing were well known to Milwaukee civil rights leaders and the general black population. In 1926, a Milwaukee Urban League report found that 90% of the, excuse me, 99% of the city's black residents were renters and had faced over, uh, rent increases of over 30, or excuse me, between 30 to 200%. Copies of racist housing covenants were in the papers of Milwaukee civil rights leaders, um, for example, Lloyd Barbie. And in the early 1940s, NAACP attorney George Brawley made a survey of the plats filed with the Register of Deeds office in Milwaukee County and found that approximately 90% of the subdivisions which had been platted in the city of Milwaukee since 1910 contained some kind of restrictive covenant that pledged that the owner not sell or rent to anyone other than of the quote, Caucasian race. And that's frequently the language that you see um, within covenants. Efforts to overcome covenants included legal challenges, and there were a lot of these um, in, in Wisconsin that we're tracking down, as well as protests, proposal of different forms of legislation, open housing legislation, and individual attempts to buy or build homes. And we're currently in the process of trying to gather more stories of, of families that attempted to buy homes in covenanted areas. And, and just as a point before I move on to this, um, just to note that I, I mentioned that we have about 5,000, uh, excuse me, 5 million images of, of property deeds between 1910 uh, and 1960. Um, based upon our preliminary work and kind of proof of concept, we estimate that we'll find somewhere between 20 to 30,000 covenants. So that gives you a sense of um, kind of the depth and scope of what we're looking at. Um, and this map right here, this is, um, I apologize for, it's kind of disorienting because in this case, uh, we're looking, um, we're looking west from the lake. Um, but I wanted to include this here because this is in 1932. And this is, this is this area, I'm not sure if I can, I don't have a laser here, but this area um, that's in the slightly darker shaded, that's the original area that's known as the inner core in Milwaukee. So these are the places is where black populations were highly confined um, for decades. So concerted opposition to uh, integration on the part of homeowners, uh, together with uh, federal and local policies, strengthened urban racial boundaries and intensified wartime and post-wartime housing crises in cities across the United States. Housing shortages created uh, uh, for growing black populations in the urban north and especially in Milwaukee, um, they were created through what was called uh, a double barrier, what acted as a double barrier. African Americans faced both deteriorating uh, and very, very limited housing stock. And actually, I want to go back to this. So this in this area, um, you know, this is this was the, the housing that existed here by the time black black uh, folks started migrating to the area was already um, very, very old. This is the oldest one of the oldest areas of the city. So it was already very dilapidated before there was a, a growth of black populations. So new black Milwaukeeans faced this double barrier deteriorating and limited housing stock combined with entrenched racism and mechanisms like covenants that prevented access to affordable, decent housing. And this intensified overcrowding and struggles um, and demands for public housing. 
Landlords exploited these conditions through rent increases, targeting black families with few options, few other options for housing. And so these, uh, these dynamics then contoured struggles over public housing in Milwaukee in the post-war years. Now I'll go back to this. My apologies. Um, these are uh, these were kind of hard to read images, but these are um, kind of newspaper clippings uh, from the 1950s from some of these organizations I'm going to talk about. Uh, historian Jeffrey Gonda contends that local property property and homeowners associations were quote the epicenter of local resistance to integration end quote. And they facilitated uh, drastic mobilizations against black home seekers and provided intense political pressure to maintain residential color lines. Thus, even as national and local real estate boards, building associations and residential developers uh, collaborated to codify racial segregation in urban space, property and homeowner organizations policed standards of their neighborhoods, vigorously defended boundaries, and relied upon the local state to enforce the carceral containment of Black residents living in Milwaukee's so-called inner core. In fact, after the passage of the 1949 Housing Act, which included federal supports for housing and urban renewal, a dizzying number of property, owner, property and homeowner organizations appeared throughout the Milwaukee metro area. Two of the most influential groups, um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, during this period what we might call white reconstruction, um, were the Affiliated Taxpayers Association and the Milwaukee County Property Owners Association. The Affiliated Taxpayers Committee was comprised primarily of local business interests and business and real estate interests. And it included uh, members from the Milwaukee Board of Realtors, the Milwaukee Builders Association, the Mount Milwaukee Association of Building Owners and Managers, and the Savings and Loan League. By contrast, the Milwaukee County Property Owners Association uh, was made up of small, uh, primarily of small time landlords and community members concerned about property rights. And here I'll just pause to say that the Milwaukee County Property Owners Association was active um, actually into the 70s. Um, so they're a very active organization um, founded again in 1949. Um, though these groups were ostensibly distinct, in fact, they had a lot of overlap and shared leadership and membership. The Milwaukee County Property uh, Association was, for example, organized initially by the Milwaukee Board of Realtors. And key figures within these organizations uh, were William Pipelo and Edward Plants, and these were in especially the 1950s, um, they were very active. And then in later decades, uh, Joseph Petska, who was uh, the chairman of the Milwaukee Property Owners Association during the open housing marches in the late 60s. Oops, um, so um, these groups were formed in the 60s, but they continued to agitate, agitate against any form of, of housing um, throughout um, the 1950s, 60s, and in the 1970s, they were also adamant um, uh, and working against a uh, school desegregation effort. And their efforts uh, were also supported by the newly emerging John Birch Society. Uh, the B John Birch Society was founded in 1950. It's now based in Appleton, Wisconsin, but it was founded, uh, one of the co-founders was a fiercely, fiercely anti-union Milwaukee area industrialist named William Greedy, um, and he actually lived in Wauwatosa. Milwaukee is famed for its socialist urban governance from 1910 to 1960. And socialism's longevity in Milwaukee politics is illustrative of the political clout of organized labor and its decline is often understood in terms of the fracturing of working class politics along the lines of race. The last socialist mayor in, uh, was uh, Frank Zeidler, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he served from 1948 to 1960. And the time when he was serving directly coincided with the rapid growth of the black community in Milwaukee. And it also coincided with the expansion of a pro federal programs for public housing and urban renewal. And so this was a period of really intense conflict over planning in the city. Uh, this is another map of the inner core. Um, and uh, I wanna just 
put this up here so you have a better sense of where this is in Milwaukee. Um, and when I say inner quorum, I'm putting that in quotes as this was the language that was used by planners and others uh, to know black neighborhoods within the city. So Milwaukee was actually a second destination for many black migrants who came by way of Chicago or other Southern states. And the city's black population grew really rapidly in the post-war era from roughly 13,000 people in 1945 to over 105,000 um, in 1970. And so this was a 700% increase in just 25 years. Though black residents made up a really small portion of the city's population in 1960, geographer Harold Rose found that Milwaukee was already one of the most segregated nation, cities in the nation. The city's black residents were confined to the so-called inner core, which we see here, and vehement white resistance to the arrival of black residents was made manifest through a number of initiatives to delimit black migration to the city and to curb public housing construction, which was explicitly racialized as black. For example, as the black population expanded, the city rezoned southern portions of the inner core. Again, if I had a laser pointer, I'd show you where it was. Um, this, that this was an effort that was explicitly, um, the zoning of this area of, of industrial activity was explicitly done to spatially contain black residents uh, to prohibit their spread into southern um, areas in the city. And limiting public housing was another key tactic. In 1952, the president of the Milwaukee County Properties Association um, noted, quote, the only thing that has kept 10,000, I 20,000 Negroes from coming here is a lack of housing. Let's keep it that way. The city's abysmal record for addressing housing issues was in fact a racial strategy pushed um, by these local property interests. This is just a map, I apologize, you can't see much, but this is um, a, a in 1958, this shows uh, where the locations of um, public housing sites were, um, as well as large urban renewal projects. So embracing the aspirations of liberal housing reformers, uh, Mayor Zeidler sought to implement uh, a program of urban renewal that was centered on slum removal um, and uh, specifically a lot of removal of the housing, the blighted housing in the, of the inner core. Um, and he, was look, he wanted to relocate residents of the inner core into integrated public housing distributed throughout the city. Um, this was his idea. Um, it didn't happen this way because Zeidler faced steep opposition from the city's white property interests, especially from the Milwaukee County Properties Association. Exploiting anti-communist hysteria uh, that was you know, sweeping the nation um, throughout the 1950s, this coalition, coalition repeatedly attacked public housing as socialistic and un-American, -Ameri effectively undermining Zeidler's efforts. The contempt for public housing in the midst of a really dramatic post-war housing crisis was understood by many and seen by many, viewed by many as explicitly anti-Black. As Zeidler stated in 1957, quote, to many people, urban renewal means public housing and to them, public housing means housing for migrant Negro families. And so they are against the whole, pro whole program, end quote. These highly organized uh, groups, and I really wanna repeat this, they, um, I'm, I'm in the midst of really learning about their strategies. They were extremely organized and in some cases funded by um, industrialists and other organizations. They worked extensively and successfully to convince white homeowners that the city's growing black population would lead to declining property values. Indeed, a common rumor circulating throughout the city in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s especially in Milwaukee's white working class South Side, was that Zeidler was going to um, import African-Americans into their neighborhoods. In 1952, um, an elderly woman grabbed Zeidler at a meeting, refusing to let go and demanded to know, quote, why are you making me sell my home? My real estate agent told me that you were going to make us sell our home to all the Negroes, and, and excuse the language here, end quote. And Zeidler responded by noting that, quote, I made speeches saying that no matter who you are, 
or what color you are, everybody deserved equal rights and opportunities, end quote. Seidler recalled that before his death, he recalled before his death that after this event, um, he had to seek uh, police protection for himself as his family, as he was increasingly uh, confronting both verbal and physical altercations about public housing. Zeidler nearly lost his fi final reelection bid when his opponents claimed uh, that he had posted billboards um, in the South inviting black citizens to move to Milwaukee to take advantage of its ostensibly social, uh, generous social programs. And the program garnered national attention and came to be known as, quote, the shame of Milwaukee. And this story was actually featured in Time Magazine um, in 1956. And um, despite the fact that I found the article, there are no accompanying images. Um, but so the shame of Milwaukee gained national attention. Seidler's successor, Mayor Henry Mayer, who I was he kind of started uh, the discussion about Milwaukee, the person who really was involved with cracking down on housing, uh, open housing protesters. He was uh, Zeidler's successor and he was a pro-growth Democrat and he took office in 1960, showing no interest whatsoever in addressing issues related to racism um, and, and the housing crisis. In fact, in his early years in office, uh, Mayor actually prohibited construction of public housing, um, and he openly rejected efforts for open housing. He declared a quote unquote, go slow approach to civil rights policy. Mayor ushered in a new era of urban renewal and highway construction, which is what we see here, um, that led to the destruction of thousands and thousands of housing units in uh, black neighborhoods in Milwaukee. And um, for those of you who uh, were happened to be at my talk yesterday, when I showed you the image of um, the building of, of I-43, um, this, uh, this is north of that area. So, um, but if we, would, if we would turn the camera around for that renewal from the downtown area and look north, this is what we might have seen. Um, so further, as Deanna Schmidt's research illustrates, um, Mayer's implementation of what was often called urban triage in the next decades actually hastened the dynamics of white flight and the disinvestment in poor neighborhoods of color. Milwaukee's Black residents and other residents of color experienced systemic discrimination and spatial isolation, confined to highly segregated neighborhoods made so uh, through conscious design. So-called red baiting uh, served as a means to undercut public housing efforts, but also functioned as a cover for the deep anti-Black racism um, that was underpinning uh, the efforts of white property interests within the city. While racial covenants and other discriminatory house, uh, housing policies have been eliminated and even outlawed, their consequences live on. Working together, they channeled investment into the growing white suburbs and facilitated disinvestment in urban areas occupied by non-white working class communities. Though racial covenants were utilized throughout cities, they were particularly throughout the city, excuse me, so we do find evidence of racial covenants within the city. Uh, they were particularly concentrated in suburban areas uh, where it was easier for developers and real estate agents, agencies uh, to um, to attach the covenants to large plots of lands before the parcer, parcels were divided, subdivided, sold, and developed. And so in my discussion of covenants today, I wanna to capture or just refer to the fact that the real estate industry and home builders capitalized on and reinforced the political economy of racial segregation. Um, and they further enshrine this in urban housing markets. People of color and ethnic minorities were not only confined to highly segregated neighborhoods produced uh, through clear design, they were also denied access to housing equity and wealth, the wealth associated with suburban home ownership. Milwaukee's indigenous black and ethnic immigrant communities experienced systemic racism and spatial isolation. And this was produced over su successive periods of white settlement and rounds of capital accumulation. In key years surrounding open housing struggles in Milwaukee, um, 
red baiting or attacking housing as socialistic served not only as a means to undercut any efforts to produce public housing, um, it also, and really importantly for my discussion about possessive whiteness and thinking about white supremacy as deeply embedded in, uh, in social systems. It not only undercut um, public housing efforts, but it protected those white property interests. And it led to the production of some of the privatized mutualities we discussed yesterday. Shifting patterns of raciali racialization and whiteness underpin these debates as working class ethnic whites, uh, ethnic residents in Milwaukee, once classified as quote unquote other, were folded into the broadening category of white as a bulwark against growing black populations in the city. Debates and struggles over housing both underpinned and reinforced variable understandings of race, particularly whiteness. Yet it's really important to note that these processes were also produced through the dialectics of struggle. Black freedom movements, indigenous struggles for self-determination, um, self and multiracial efforts uh, to push for and demand for open housing have challenged and reshaped urban racial geographies in Milwaukee. In my talk today, I've emphasized struggles over residential property in particular, but also public housing to illustrate connections between property and race and their co-production. Um, I wanna highlight how discriminatory housing policies and mobilizations that challenge the possessive logics and legal mechanisms of, of whiteness um, enforced, or excuse me, in, impacted and shaped um, housing mobilizations in subsequent decades. Discriminatory housing policy has often been viewed and not incorrectly as an extension of Jim Crow era segregation and policies. But what sorts of new questions might emerge if we think through racist housing policy in the urban industrial North not as or as part of an ongoing colonial project predicated on the logics of white dispossession, excuse me, white possession and displacement. Such a framing contests white settler epistemologies that ex exclude indigenous histories and challenge us to consider residential property within a much longer history of white settlement and territorial appropriation. This focus resists a static understanding of race. Um, and, and, and understandings of race that are unmoored from the, place, from the places in which they emerge. And this reveals the fluidity of racial categories and the ways in which practices of racialization are possessively defined and constructed in specific contexts. White supremacy produced through structures of domination is not in inexorable, nor is, is it unchanging. And this is of course, something we talked a lot about yesterday. But it has been intimately bound up with hegemonic notions of dispossession. From the, proper to, from the propertizing of human life via slavery to the creation of liberal norms of property aimed at abolishing communal property holdings and to structures and policies excluding people of color and women from the material advantages and benefits of properties. Examining, examining systems of property uh, and race as they are continuously remade through hierarchies of value and power grounded in place, I argue, helps us to think about the ongoing production of white supremacist logics and their possessive geographies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Anne, that was really terrific. Um, all right, so we have approximately uh, 20 some minutes. So um, we've got a, an opportunity then to um, engage in a conversation. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm sure most of you are, but nonetheless, for those of you who aren't, in order, what we're gonna do is that if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu there and one of the options is participants. If you click on that, you can select, um, uh, you can use the option of raising your hand and that'll alert me that you want to ask a question. So I'll keep a, a stack or a queue. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, because what I'll ask you to do is to go on camera um, and just for the benefit of everybody hearing your voice and not mine. Um, otherwise you will hear mine if you wanna use the chat. So that is the function immediately to the right of participants, just write in a question there and I'll read it out to everyone. But again, you'll have the benefit of hearing uh, 
a different voice. <laughs> so who would like to go first? Please do step forward. Anyone? Well, let me jump in then. Um, I'm wondering if, if I mean, so this is in preparation of a, I mean, this is a book in progress, is it not? Um, so I'm wondering what role uh, policing in your story will play. Um, I mean, Mayor, H Henry Mayer, of, of course, also was accompanied by the longstanding sheriff, Harold Breyer, who is notorious yep. for being a particularly yep. ruthless and racist uh, chief of police. So I'm wondering if you can say that something about that. Um, and also, <laughs> Aaron Schutz. Okay, we have a couple of other questions. Maybe I can throw them in and then because they're brief, and you can choose how you want to respond. So Absolutely. Matthew Whiting asks, how would you say racial segregation is carried out today in Milwaukee? Mm -hmm. And Aaron Schutz says, can you say more about why Milwaukee suburbs are so hyper segregated still today? So they're interested in current developments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first to your your question, Patrick, um, I actually, you could tell that I wanted to include a lot more here that is not in this talk. If, if I had enough time, I'd just keep going. But I actually had to cut a section um, that was really um, about the kind of moral panic over growing Black populations that emerged um, in that same period. So in 1952, um, uh, a mentally ill Black man um, murdered uh, a couple of people in Milwaukee. And even though Milwaukee actually had one of the lowest uh, crime rates in the nation, this actually um, kind of was layered on top of these this growing panic over growing Black populations. And um, Mayor Harold, or excuse Excuse me, Police Chief Harold Breyer uh, responded directly. He was uh, uh, said that he was uh, going to make sure that he uh, kept things in line. And so this is something I've written about elsewhere. This is the start of what I argue is a real buildup of, of policing and really policing uh, the the boundaries of race in Milwaukee. Um, and so then we can see, you know, Breyer was notorious, as you know, you know, for um, encouraging his officers to rough up civil rights agitators. Um, he encouraged his offers, uh, officers during the open housing marches um, to actually, you know, this sounds quite familiar to all of us, cover their badges so that they couldn't be identified. And so um, Harold Breyer plays a really important part in this discussion. Um, to the next question, what are the, some of the ways in which, um, which segregation continues today? I'm really glad that you asked that because um, one of the things that's frustrating um, is that often within uh, popular discussions and really just common sense understandings of segregation, we often formulate or posit it as something that's past oriented. And so this is something that we hear a lot about in Milwaukee, even um, amongst progressive and liberals, you know, saying, well, it's all these things that happen. It's the redlining maps, it's, it's these other things. And of course, those, those dynamics play a critical role. I've just spent, you know, 45 minutes talking about them. Um, but we have to understand that these boundaries are continued uh, to be maintained in very, very specific and clear ways. And so, uh, you know, we could have a longer conversation about this, but one of the things that I would point to um, in the very first instance is, pat you know, patterns of um, investment and disinvestment in the city uh, that shape questions about where folks want to live, um, where the goods and resources are distributed, but also, once again, policing. Um, some of my research uh, that with Jenna, actually Jenna Lloyd, um, has revealed the way in which, you know, the, the boundaries, for example, between Milwaukee and Wauwatosa, they're, they're actually very porous, you know, you can, for those of you who are familiar, you can be, um, you know, kind of right on the boundary and not be sure which place you're in, but if there's extensive policing in these areas, they're, they're very heightened and monitored boundaries. Um, and we worked with young people who have talked about the fact that they've been removed from areas around Wauwatosa and taken back to the city, um, you know, and, and, and with the assumption that they don't belong in Wauwatosa, they couldn't possibly live in Wauwatosa. Um, Aaron, I'm not sure, can you, the third question, Aaron Schutz's question, can you remind me of that one, um, Patrick? Yes. Uh, so he says, can you say more about why Milwaukee suburbs are so hyper segregated still today? Yeah, um, I mean, I think this is something that 
we uh, we need to discuss as you know we need to come to terms with as as a community we need to have these long conversations but my first my first answer would be structural racism um, that the fact that you know these places have been created as white spaces they've been known to be hostile to people of color um, and for these reasons, uh, you know, that there are barriers uh, to, um, to housing. There's also been extensive effort um, until very recently, there's very little effort to build affordable housing um, within the suburbs. And in fact, um, uh, municipalities like New Berlin have actually um, gone to court for their refusal to accept uh, affordable housing. Um, and they've, they've, they've gotten in hot water um, um, from HUD and from other federal agencies for refusing to accept uh, or build affordable housing because you know the this, the claim is we well we don't want crime we don't want these things happening here but of course all of this is kind of coded and layered within these discourses of race and racism that are have long standing histories in in the area. Great. Um, so we've got several more questions. Let me go first to Nicole. Uh, most of these are in the chat. Um, she asks. She says, first of all, excellent talk, thank you. Could you speak more about the connection, if there was one, between the 67 uprising and the open housing demonstrations? In your research, have you come across the commandos um, organizations after the open housing demonstrations? In other words, did they continue to play a role in housing policy after the 60s? Great, fantastic question. So um, the, the 1967 uprising, the way that these were connected uh, was that that uprising was specifically, it was part of, of course, the long hot summer, the, the rebellions that are happening across cities um, all over the, the country. Um, but the, the specific reasons that people took to the street in Milwaukee were about number one, police brutality, and number two, lack of access to housing. Uh, and so these issues were simmering and, and they, were, they were there. The, the city was primed for the open housing marches because uh, these struggles over housing um, had been building for so long. There was just, it was a crisis of epic proportions. And so I think, you know, you, you didn't have, um, you didn't, I, 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 it's funny, I'd have to look back to see like which groups were specifically part of the, the 1967, excuse me, the 67 uprising in July. Um, but, you know, I think there's lots of organizations and overlap um, between these movements. And in terms of um, how did, how did these organizations continue to work um, after the 1960s, um, a huge shift in focus um, uh, and, and this was already in the works in the 1960s, but there was a, the, the education became the primary uh, focus of, of a lot of the struggles, not as though the housing issues were solved, but after the passage of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, uh, education became also a key issue. Efforts to um, get, get uh, you know, magnet schools and different kinds of schools within the city of Milwaukee. And um, Father Grappi was very active in this movement as well as, as, well as other folks like Lloyd Barbie. Um, in terms of the commandos, you know, they, they, there are many commandos that are still around today that are still active in various uh, civil rights struggles. Um, and so I'd have to look and see, you know, which, which they were, um, how they were involved in the post um, 1960 eras. But this, of course, um, not long after this, we have the Black Panthers working on their free lunch program. So um, there's a lot of overlap and continuities between um, the mobilizations that were taking place. Okay, great. So next we, um, Jenna Lloyd has a question and she's gonna go on camera. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, and great to see my UWM colleagues in the chat too. Um, I was feeling uh, sheepish about asking a question, but since my UWM colleagues are, I will too. Um, I wonder, Anne, if you could speak, I was thinking about um, Lisa McGurr's work on, um, the development of the new right in um, in Orange County, and she pays a lot of attention to like women's gatherings in their kitchens and like coffee clutches and things like that. Yeah. And so, as you're doing research on um, these property associations and taxpayers associations and Birch Society, also, um, have you found um, have you found anything about the role that like these kind of um, these kind of spaces also played in um, in this development. Yes, and you're you're asking exactly uh, what I'm really 
digging into right now, uh, which is one of my uh, really big interests is like, what role did white women play in all this? And we know they played a significant role. Um, one of the things uh, that, that I already am documenting and have been able to find is the letter writing campaigns that were spearheaded by women. And they were in they were, it, again, as I spoke to the intense organization and the efforts that were at work, um, you know, white women were, were central in uh, performing this labor. Um, they, the, uh, it, the box, uh, Zeidler's papers um, at Milwaukee County Library, I mean, there's just whole folders of letters. And, you know, they're, they're wild. It's wild to look at these letters, but it, I'd have to do a count, but so many of them are from women um, talking about the sanctity of schools, um, the sanctity and purity of neighborhoods and the need to protect uh, property rights, both for the and, and the domestic ideal for the well being of neighborhoods and communities. So that's a key line of my investigation. Um, and I'm hoping to have more to share about that soon. Okay, we have several questions. And what I'm going to suggest is that we close the stack at this point. No, no, I, I just can't imagine we get to all of these in time and then accommodate more. So um, next is Alfred Varnick, who in the chat asks, what sort of effect did the emergence of business improvement districts in 1989 play in the segregation of Milwaukee? Thank you for asking that. Um, uh, I, I wish I could see you because I'm wanting to look around to see who's asking this, but um, bids uh, are a fascinating dynamic that are really interesting to look at in Milwaukee. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but um, Milwaukee uh, has more bids, or at least at one time, it had more bids, uh, business improvement districts, um, than, um, than New York City, than Chicago, than Seattle. Um, I had a graduate student who did work on these. And what's fascinating is I understand bids as uh, emerging, as being part of uh, the really interesting kind of neoliberal experimentation that has a long history um, in Milwaukee. Um, so Milwaukee was an early, early and very enthusiastic um, adopter of business improvement districts. And of course, part of this is because of the municipal crisis. Uh, the city uh, can no longer afford uh, to offer these you know, the basic services. So what they do is create these bid organizations wherein um, business owners or property owners pay in so that they can uh, pay for you know, whatever kinds of uh, services they'd like in their neighborhood, cleanup services, signs, lights, hanging planters. And what we see and what research has demonstrated in Milwaukee is that the bids just actually amplify, even though they've been kind of, especially for low income neighbors, neighborhoods of color, it's been like, okay, here's a way that you can get services um, and that you can kind of work for beautification efforts and do all these other things to improve your neighborhood. The bid, because the bids and, and the money that bids have available to them is directly tied to the valuation of property, this means that the bids in the city of Milwaukee just uh, enhance and reproduce existing inequalities. The really wealthy bids are in really wealthy neighborhoods and they do all sorts of stuff. The, the wealthiest bid is in um, downtown, the third ward bid. They've been able to um, build their own parking garage they have their own quasi downtown kind of security force. Um, you know, they're not conscripted to do any security work, but if you see them, sometimes they're on segways, they have blue coats. They're supposed to be downtown ambassadors, um, but they're funded by the bid. So you compare that then to the bid that's on MLK Street and you see a, a vastly different dynamic. So that's obviously something I'm really interested in and could talk about more, but I'll stop there because I know there are a range of other questions. Great, so I'm gonna move next to Jamie Harris, who says, great talk, thanks. Milwaukee's public housing history was different than in other cities. Do you see that as part of Milwaukee's distinctive history instead of racialized policies, responses, or something else compared to other cities like Chicago and St. Louis? Yeah, I see a couple of questions about this. I see uh, Regents also asked this too. Um, and it's really hard to put a finger on, on these things in terms of, you know, we know this is happening elsewhere. This is happening throughout the, the, throughout the industrial north, uh, other cities. But 
I am one of those people that thinks that while Milwaukee is illustrative of these broad trends, um, these things are happening elsewhere. I, I do think that there's a unique dimension here. Um, I do think it has to do with socialism and socialist politics. I think that has a lot to do with public housing and the struggles over public housing. I don't really think that you could even, I mean, I'm sure that there would be another way to critique these. I think the casting public housing as socialistic, again, happened in other cities that weren't actually uh, governed by socialist mayors. Um, but I think that the way that that took hold here and the way that that really fractured the kinds of uh, labor and broader support for socialist policy, um, is I, I, I find it as being significant. Great, okay, so we have a question coming from Kermit Hovey, um, who's gonna go on camera and unmute his microphone. There. Hi, Kermit. Okay, good. Sorry, the, the mute was toggling, waiting for permission to unmute. So th glad to have heard your talk, at least in part. Um, one puzzle I have, it, in a way it reminds me of the issue with like the, the, the problem with Kansas, I think was the title of the book. It's like, why are, isn't there a way in which the business interests were working against their business interests? As you you mentioned, all kinds of professional society, or not professional societies, but business organizations, it sounded like that were pushing this agenda of perpetuating the discrimination and the racism. And I'm going, what was their business case? What were they thinking? Were they just totally ignoring the the proverbial profit motive and just sticking to we can't have those people in our town kind of thinking or what 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 would I anyways that, that's the thrust of the yeah query I, I have. think yeah that's a great question Kermit because one of the things that I didn't get to talk about here is that there was a lot of money to be made over this there was a lot of money that was being made over this, right? You have a, a captive and bound marginalized population. And I say captive, you know, just in terms of these structures that are preventing people from accessing housing markets in other areas of the city. Um, and so, you know, the, the, one of the things is that, that there was, you could charge the rents were extraordinarily high. This is, remains the case in Milwaukee. Um, you would expect rents uh, to be lower in uh, marginalized communities, um, but that's not the case, actually. If you look at rents, um, and that's this is this is a, this is the case um, during this period of time. So you've got uh, black residents who want better housing; they're overcrowded, um, and the housing is terrible quality. They're looking for other options, um, but they can't move elsewhere in the city or into the suburbs. And then you have landlords who are charging exorbitant prices. Um, and in fact, this was a lot, a lot, lot, lot of what the Milwaukee Urban League was up to and the NAACP um, in, um, in the 30, 20s, 30s, and 40s was trying to help people with a uh, rent assistant and try to put pressure um, on re improving quality housing because they saw this exploitation happening. People couldn't leave their neighborhoods, but then they're being charged extraordinarily high rates. So, you know, in addition to that, you know, I think there's a case for the fact that white people and white business interests explicitly tied what they saw as the value of their properties, the value of their neighborhoods um, to whiteness. And their assumption was, uh, is that, you know, greater uh, racial diversity, um, heterogeneity would you know, automatically start to reduce the value of their their property. And, you know, I think the property, though, is really just a, a way and what I've kind of tried to argue is it's a, it's a way to articulate racism. It's the way that racism and and ideas about property are kind of co articulated because, you know, for me, these understandings uh, about property were fundamentally and always racialized. Mm -hmm. Not sure if that gets at your question, but yeah, it helps unpack it. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I think I prematurely closed the stack because you did such a good job of handling two of the people's questions at once. Um, I don't know if anybody has another question. If not, I have one. And I'm happy to defer. Ah, here, Sarah Moore. Uh, 
you need to unmute. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, I did that. I got some kind of weird error there. Um, hi, Anne. Thank you so much. For not just the talk today, but for yesterday, I really enjoyed both of them. And I apologize to everybody for the glare over my head here. Um, so I have, I think, what's a, a kind of a pretty straightforward question um, of the many that I could ask. Um, I'm wondering if you know of or could speak to the possibility of any kind of regional effects of these policies in Milwaukee. So did, um, did the policies in Milwaukee push people, for example, towards the Madison market? Um, and I know that that's not your specific area of study, but I'm curious if you, if you have any ideas about that. I, that, I, that's actually a question I don't know the answer to, but I think it's really interest. I mean, when I think of the regional effects, I mean, I think of the really clear, you know, the wow, the, the, the map that I started with, it's, it's really the what we see um, in the Oza Washington, Waukesha, and Ozaki counties um, that, um, you know, I use that map, even though it's ugly, just because you can see these so the stark, stark boundaries. It's literally at the border of the county um, that there's just a full on stop of, of black populations where it moves into this whiteness. So um, I would imagine, and I do believe that, you know, I've have heard anecdotes that um, people left, you know, uh, during this period of time when there was this housing crisis and there was no way to move out of the inner core, um, the people did return to places like Chicago uh, where, you know, things are not better in Chicago. There's maybe even amplified in some ways, but there there was actually uh, more housing for folks that were looking for it in Chicago. Yeah, thank you. I would I would imagine Madison wasn't any better either. I was just curious. Yeah, I you know I know that there are folks in Madison who are interested in and in doing work on covenants, and so I'd love to hook up with folks. You know, because there's the interesting thing about the covenants is that there is a really vast network of the way that the information was shared between, you know, real estate boards in larger cities to smaller cities and vice versa. So um, I would be interested to know more about how, you know, how and if um, interests collaborated between these two significant cities in the state and in what way and to what effect. Thanks again. All right. Well, we've arrived at two o'clock, which is our normal stop, um, ending point. So I just want to thank you very much on behalf of everybody for a really a couple, great couple of days. These are really terrific talks. And I am looking forward to seeing the book when it comes out. Um, yes. So thanks.